Hey, what's up, Plus Soldier fam? Let's explore a bit more of this timeline where Zabuza has survived and was rescued by Team 7. When we last left off, Zabuza, while further adjusting to Leaf Village life and joining Kakashi, Guy, and Asuma in training, soon took on Team Konohamaru's students, per the insistence of Tsunade and Naruto. His training yielding much more impressive results for all three students than Ebisu's did. And to boot, after two and a half years away with Jiraiya training, Naruto's return to the village now. Upon returning to the village in this timeline, the now Uzumaki swordsman is set upon much faster by Kunohamaru and his friends as he surveys the village atop a streetlight. Below on the ground, Jiraiya awaits him as the students of Zabuza arrive and yell up to their senpai to come down. Excitedly, Naruto jumps down and begins to catch up with everyone. And knowing the two knuckleheads, this inevitably results in Konohamaru demonstrating his progress with the sexy jutsu. So a significant change in this timeline is Sakura arriving to see this and may hit Naruto a small bit harder for teaching him that. And more importantly, this version of Wegi now has the power to better correct her teammates' behavior. Just as Naruto recovers, a swirl of leaves and mist heralds the arrival of both Kakashi and Zabuza, the latter complaining about the former, telling Kakashi to not step in on his entrance. Naruto is happy and excited to see his other teachers, and the two lead their teams and Jiraiya back to report to Lady Fifth at Okage Tower. This wouldn't be much different than canon, just kinda inserts Zabuza into a lot of it. And as most suspect, Zabuza taking such a large interest in Naruto's development in this timeline does want to be involved in Kakashi's bell test. Kakashi mentions that is the one stepping in on people. Not in the mood to hear the two joining bicker, Tsunade orders Kakashi to just allow Zabuza some part in the bell test. Besides, if he wasn't careful, her student Sakura would surprise him, so he could use the help. Injecting his own idea and correctly guessing that Sakura has likely been promoted by now, Jiraiya suggests that she lead a four-man getting team from both teams against both Joni, give one bell to each, and really test the kids' teamwork by using their own against them. This sounds reasonable enough, and so the plan is set. Fast forwarding to this, I honestly would enjoy going extremely in depth with this matchup, but at the same time, this would be somewhat what you would expect, and with writing and choreographing a fight scene, especially a Naruto one, it is somewhat hard for me to not go all out with it. But still, you're going to see Zabuza and Kakashi putting up a united front that none of the students can really stand up against alone to get the belt, but by utilizing everyone's strengths and possibly the dirty trick of yelling make out tactic spoilers and capitalizing on Kakashi being thrown off, they jump Zabuza and retrieve both belts at some point. Now that said, you would see some very key moments like Naruto showing Zabuza his swordsmanship, now it's grown, likely utilizing his clones and tandems with his sword, so moves like using their swords as big shields in a line and giving Naruto a platform to maybe jump off of and shoot himself off of in the midair, that'll be very impressive to Zabuza and he'll like seeing that stuff and seeing that even though he wasn't there to teach Naruto by hand, Naruto has somewhat gotten his own style of using that big sword he gave him. I'm sure he would have some small critiques, but for the most part, Naruto will look pretty fast, strong, and competent with a sword. That said, Zabuza has learned better than to continue a duel with his one-hit kill weapon and so would remind Naruto there's a very big difference in the way he fights and how Naruto usually does. He uses the hidden Mizujutsu and substitutes himself with a water clone to get behind Naruto. Once he does, he watches as he swings and turns the clone into a puddle. But after he does, the mentor appears behind him and ruthlessly snaps his arms around him in a tight chokehold. And he's sure to isolate the arm wielding his sword to take away those powerful swings, even going so far as to fall forward and force Naruto's face into the grass as he flails helplessly. Zabuza reminds Naruto that even though Master Jirai encourages him to use his brute strength, he doesn't have to come at every single situation like a brawler. And just before the Uzumaki passes out from the dirty play, his teammates intervene and save him. I'd also imagine seeing Sakura and Naruto planning a pretty well devised coordinated assault with everyone involved, like we see her and Wagi mowing down the tree line that Zabuza and Kakashi might be hiding in and then using Sinbone to draw him out of hiding and blowing away that thick mist and everything. Udon can use that snot trap technique to keep him in one place, while Naruto and Konohamaru, per the instructions of coming at the Joni with intent to kill, go for the potent attack of a combined giant Rasengan. That said, this is still a stronger Zabuza and Kakashi work together, pretty much negging all of this, which would make that dirty trick of spoiling makeout tactics very necessary. So in addition to making sure that Team Kakashi is ready to go back on active duty again, this test helps Zabuza realize that his kits have advanced by a lot, and the upcoming tuning exams may be something they're prepared for. Wanting to be truly certain, he decides he wants to take the team on a B-ranked mission. Meanwhile, in the Land of Wind, the events that took place originally with Datora and Sasori's invasion of the Sand Village would virtually be the exact same. Remember, the only major differences between Gaara and Naruto compared to canon here would be Gaara likely viewed Naruto as higher quality prey a lot faster than he did in canon, and the fact that Gamakin instead of Punta took on Chukaku with Naruto. So Gaara has still become the fifth Hokage at the moment, and while protecting the village, is defeated by Datora's viciously intelligent assault. The golf rail would go out to the leaf, and just like in canon, Tsunade decides to send Team Kakashi. There's even greater reason here since Naruto would look better than he did in canon. And while I'm sure of the series title, the immediate assumption is that Zabuza would also be involved in this, 
That just isn't the case. Remember, he has his own team to take care of and train, and getting them involved the likes of the Akatsuki just isn't smart and would be out of character for this version of him. Yes, he will miss out on the reunion with Kisame, but remember that's not going to be the real Kisame, and it's not as if anyone knows that going into the situation. But don't worry, let that feud brew a bit longer, and allow Team Guy their canon place here for now. No, instead Zabuza has followed upon that idea for a B rank mission for his team, and asked Tsunade for one the same day of Team 7's departure, though little does he know there are still unseen dangers. Now as for what happens at the Kazakai rescue mission, sadly again, it won't be changing a huge amount. Swordsmanship won't be helping Naruto against Deidara, but his grasp on a few long range elements of ninjutsu will, and I can even imagine he and Kakashi landing a more substantial blow in this timeline. In this video, we'll be focusing on Team Zabuza and their B rank mission. Now Zabuza having seen their work not under his command, now wants to see his team tested against other shinobi their age. And to do that, he can maybe set up a situation where his team can compete with another Genin team for the same goal. But he could also deem that being not too necessary. Instead, a small bit more difficulty may be worth it. It's possible a mission which could assuredly involve conflict with other shinobi, or a good amount of non-shinobi opponents that could present his team a challenge Genin usually couldn't complete on their own. He wasn't so much worried about the survival skills and information based work as it was all stuff they could work on in time. Zabuza wouldn't enter them into the exams unless their chances of success were high. Now, the exact logistics don't exactly matter since we've got no knowledge of all the missions that are available at this. And all you really need is some type of take this item here, fight this group of bandits if they attack you here kind of mission. One where Zabuza expects to find a large danger and would usually need to aid his students only for him to leave and then let them film for themselves while he watches closely and intervenes only if necessary. This is also much more simple than bringing in non-canon or original characters to serve as antagonists here for them to fight. So we read into the narrative with Team Kakashi and Tamari getting ready to depart from the village and Team Zabuza arriving to the village gates as well. The squads wish each other luck and Zabuza asks Kakashi to keep an eye out and tell he finds out anything about Kisame before they all disappear from the village gates to go on their journeys. I believe after their big bell test of Team 7, Konohamaru is going to be even more enthusiastic about learning swordsmanship from Zabuza and likely growing a bit jealous at Udon's already having learned some Kenjutsu from their sensei and Naruto's self-made progress. Both were easily more cool and effective than the very basic and tedious techniques that Ebisu would teach him with the sword. So to keep Konohamaru from bugging the entire team for the duration of the mission, Zabuza attempts to incentivize his students by informing them their performance in this mission will decide if they are allowed to participate in the upcoming tuning exams. The Genin do get excited, but Konohamaru, ever greedy to further and further increase his skills, asks if Zabuza would also tack on teaching Konohamaru Kenjutsu to that as well. Of course, this would cause Moegi to voice her refusal to let Konohamaru get even more special training. If he's learning something, then so is she. Now listening to his friends and teacher go back and forth, Udon summons up the confidence that Zabuza had slowly been stealing in him and stakes his own claim in Zabuza's time in training him. However, he isn't able to keep that confidence and voice that his new aspirations to surpass and protect his teammates. Not taking the demands well, Zabuza proceeds to tell each of them off and remind them their ranks. He decides when and how to train them, and beyond that, ain't no literal snot nose getting telling him how to teach them. Interrupting his tirade, he'd find the kunoichi of his team hugging him around the waist as they walked. His demand to know why only irritated him further, as the girl reported that Lady Tsunade said that they should be nice to Zabuza when he gets all yelly and angry like that. To plead his case even further, Konohamaru latched on as well, and Zabuza began trying to pry the children off once he felt Udon joining as well. And with that, he switched to jumping through the trees for travel. While the Ginyan enjoy the time with their teacher, very far away, a single shinobi observes them with a single eye that is not his own. A veteran shinobi of the mist village perched high in the tree line and accompanied by two of the shinobi of the village wearing basic hunter core attire. The two question their senior, referring to him as Ao, and ask if he can confirm the target's identity through his mask. The other shinobi reports that the face is Zabuza Momochi's under the mask, but there is no telling if that really is Momochi. Think about it, missing ninja or foreign ones attack a group of trapping leaf shinobi, they unmask one and discover he's a foreign missing ninja with a high bingo book bounty. It'd be a pretty sweet deal, but remember, shinobi are supposed to seek through deception. This could very obviously be some type of trap to lure in other shinobi who might be tracking down Momochi. For now, Al decides to sit back and wait and decide if the bait is worth taking. Now at some point in the crux of the mission for Team Zabuzo, it would come and a large scale battle would break out against way more bandits than what we see Team 7 taking on in the first anime opening. And Zabuza does peace out very early on and pay close attention to his students and their performance. And I think he'd be pleased. Moegi would probably quickly react to his disappearance and inform her teammates that this was likely a part of Zabuza's testing them and corral their enemies with high speed attacks and sin bone attacks. Then Udon can step up and surprise his teammates and mostly himself with how far he's come, using his ninja art mucus trap to mobilize a great deal of enemies and delivering powerful knockout blows to the back of his sword. And finally, Konohamaru not only uses his powerhouse abilities, but also shows less and less of his show-offy tendencies. He isn't yelling constantly and drawing attention to himself, often setting up his teammates to land more significant blows than he is. He's even using the much tamer number of shadow clones that he can muster, not for attacking, but to act as partners to his teammates to ensure that no one took damage as unlikely as that was in this fight. So yeah, Zabuza is pretty pleased. 
There was still always going to be room to grow in his eyes, but it seemed the things that he'd label as his team's issues had been greatly diminished in a very short amount of time, if not done away with altogether. The only other thing to work on now would probably be stamina for all three of them since after that big fight, they're a bit tired. He'd reveal himself soon enough to his protégés, and they aren't too happy about his not fighting with them. Ignoring the dirty looks, he declares that he's made a decision. They were indeed ready for the tuning exams, lightening the mood a great deal. The team would likely then go back to the client or clients, which would have issue with a group of traveling bandits, and report their success before deciding to return to the leaf. Again, we see the Miznidge watching the group from far away, and they aren't exactly happy that Zabuza didn't participate. But the other two decide that this mission wasn't urgent enough to warrant them rushing anything. If they weren't sure about the target, then why engage now? I'll be raised to the two and mentions that in his day, Shinobi really did have to endure and complete the missions. They weren't just participation points. No, if they couldn't confirm the target's identity because they hadn't seen him fight yet, then it was time to force a show of combat ability by the Joni Commander, as the Guinea were already pretty much wiped out. They just needed to plan a simple ambush. We fast forward into the trip back to the Leaf and see the students walking again out of necessity and asking Zabuza what his tuning and Joni promotions were like, but they soon realize they don't have the stomach for the details and Zabuza lacks the ability to censor himself enough for their sensitive young ears. But using his own, the slightest single clanking of chains was Zabuza's only warning as he opened his arms wide and grabbed all three students before jumping away from their previous location as metal claw-like objects shot out and made a decent sized crater where the team had been standing. Landing, Zabuza puts them down and whispers to the kids to stay close, calm, and don't use names. The two younger Miss Ninja from before reel in the chain clawed gauntlets and reveal themselves with their surprise attack having failed. They demand to you know if that really is Zabuza Momochi behind that mask. Zabuza is a bit surprised of how they knew, but doesn't actually show it. And in a practice impression of Kakashi, coolly answers that these guys are barking up the wrong tree. In his head though, Zabuza is surprised that he recognized the voice of the two, but not enough to need an exact story of how they were pardoned by the village. He just assumes that real Hunter Ninja found Gozo and Mizu, and after their failed attempt on Kakashi, and after he himself disappeared from the land of waves and nobody left behind, of the Hakus, they must have taken them and kept them for interrogation, though he highly doubted these idiots guess he'd affected the leaf. The brothers, unsatisfied with this answer, resolve to fight, and the siblings drop into perfect synchronicity as they crisscross and hook their gauntlets back up, creating a chainsaw effect. Displaying a bit of improvement in speed since last he saw them, they rush Zabuza, intent on ripping him apart with a spinning chain. Trying to remember what else he could about the Demon Brothers, Zabuza reaches for the armband which holds the seal for summoning his sword, but hesitates, not wanting to fully blow his cover. In a split second though, he decides on a different kind of defense, but doesn't need to act. Surprising him, his male students leave in front of him with their swords at the ready. The chains slam against them, and they pull tight drawing the Demon Brothers to a stop, and into a perfect position for Moegi and Zabuza to capitalize on. The brothers, however, seem to have planned for this, and again show improvement. They tuck forward, and their chain pushes back against Uda and Konohamaru's grip, enough that they end up rolling away while Konohamaru's sword even snaps. Zabuza doesn't have time to give Konohamaru advice about not buying replica swords, but instead, he avenges his students by showing the fruits of swinging around such a large weapon himself. He strikes out at both with simple push to their chests, and they are sent skidding away and onto their feet as Zabuza pursues and begins to demonstrate with almost three years of taijutsu sparring with my guy, rewards. Allowing the Demon Brothers to stay in the fight solely due to teamwork and Zabuza not being able to use his more deadly attacks. Meanwhile, Moegi goes to check on our teammates. None of them are ready for a fight right now, especially against Shinobi, but they're resolved to join Zabuza and take down the threat together. But inexperience and exhaustion come back to bite them. Their focus on Gozu and Mizu blinds them to the older shinobi who body flickers into the middle of all three of them, striking out the boys with shift chops to the neck and leaving them unconscious instantly. The opponent whose speed was great enough to get him out of a battle with Shisui of teleportation was far too fast for Udon and Konohamaru to react to, but Moegi had a split second longer to try and counter. This only allowed her to make a groan of pain before she too fell to the opponent. But the noise again alerts Zabuza, and this concerns him to take him out of the battle for a single second. Thankfully though, he had just knocked one of the brothers back once again and easily counters the other, allowing him to take that glance. With it now 3 on 1, Al joins into the fight and zooms over to utilize that amazing speed once again and aid Gozu and Mizu in wrapping Zabuza up in the chains and restraining him. Finally, he stops in front of Zabuza and throws his mask to the ground, warning that if he really was Zabuza Momochi, then he knew what getting cut by these chains meant. In response, the former assassin only threatened, growing mad to strain against his bindings and make the gauntlets creak and strain as well. Gozu and Mizu then tighten the chain and he is forced to calm himself. Now with his face other than what is behind his bandages revealed, Gozu and Mizu are shocked that this guy really was Zabuza or had at least been transformed into him the entire time. But still, his actions don't lend to that idea as well. The thought of him leading a team and being this fiercely loyal to them just didn't really make much sense. Now surveying their surroundings for miles around, Al confirms that there are no signs of backup. From their vital signs, these kids really aren't conscious. That means that this has to be the real Zabuza, and he says that phase two of their mission commences now. He demands that Zabuza relinquish the Kubakiri Bocho, or Executioner's Blade, and allow them to execute him here and now. Obviously, this is refused, but Zabuza has to find a way out of this. 
To his credit though, he does come up with one idea for escape very fast, though it is brutal and a bit of a gamble. And in service of this plan, he comes clean. He reveals that he is the real Momochi Zabaza, and he reveals that the Executioner's Blade is stored in a seal under his arm warmers, and says that all they have to do is channel a bit of chakra into it. His only request is that that be the weapon of his demise. Ao again watches carefully, being sure nothing is a lie, and then, as a smart commander would, he does not test the honesty of that statement himself. Instead, he orders Mizu to do it, and the younger Shinobi complains. The chains on one side of Zabaza's body are loosened as Mizu slowly approaches and asks which arm warmer it is. Placing his hand there, he does just as Zabaza said and channels a bit of chakra, and lo and behold, the blade does appear. Its full weight materializing, and because of where Mizu is standing, it forces his tip into the ground, and more importantly, through the toes on Mizu's foot. In excruciating pain, he flops onto his back and yells, and Zabaza instantly leaves onto this chance. Using his free hand, and knowing that Ao would have the speed to attack him if his next move doesn't impede any attack coming at him and get the chains off him, he again has to take another big gamble, so he attempts to use single-handed hand signs. Remember, this is a skill he likely could practice, and one I believe he would attempt to master due to how he touted Haku as his superior so much in the original timeline. And remember, this is data as a feat of skill, not something only possible with a Keke Genkai. It's like creating ninjutsu with no hand seals or words, something really talented Shinobi can do with lots of practice and effort. Remembering back to a technique of one of his former contemporaries and a hated enemy, and more importantly, the cool and precise talent of his first student, the former assassin pushes his limits further and further and is able to unleash a large water prison jutsu around himself and the demon brothers. The chains lose grip and he takes the opportunity to tug them further away and slip out, leaving the target trapped inside the bubble of water as he lunges for his sword to defend from Ao, but he misanticipates his enemy's next move. Instead of coming directly towards him, the man snatches the sword and attempts to flee with his amazing speed, now weighed down a bit. Zabaza gives chase and ducks as Al strikes back at him and neither removes his torso from his waist, though he does succeed in scratching through his flak jacket and putting a small scratch on his stomach as well. Zabaza grips the back of the blade to hold it still and attempts to strike out at Al, but the more experienced Joning lets go of the sword and backs off with a flash step, perching back over the students of Zabaza and threatening him to stand down or he'll escalate this even further. Remember, Zabaza has improved a lot and Al isn't a combat ninja. He was mostly seen here to lead the troops and use his eye. Zabaza readjusts his grip on the executioner's blade and reminds Al of what he said about touching them. He now holds his sword with two hands, and Al curiously raises an eyebrow, thinking this was a challenge to re-engage him. But he obviously wouldn't do that, and the moment Zabaza weed hand signs, he'd be too fast to do something before he could. Just then, Zabaza released a large burst of potent killing intent, but Al being so experienced in dealing with his Kage is pretty used to something like this. In fact, Al could almost make out a dense, demonic face of Chakra. Even so, he produced a kunai for each target, clear warning that any more movement would result in their deaths. Zabaza also gives a warning. One last time, move away, or it's over. But then, with Byakugan, he noticed something, another new skill that Zabaza seemed to have learned. The chakra forming around him went directly onto and coated his sword. The realization of what was next came nearly too late, but Al once again proved himself superior to Zabaza in speed and jumped up just in time to also avoid being split in half. And as Byakugan allows him to see an entire path of trees cut down in an instant from the attack. And to boot, he wasn't as fast as he thought. As a cut on his shirt appeared, and soon blood began to trickle out of a wound on his stomach. So, still in midair, the seasoned shinobi says that he gives up and that phase two of the mission is a failure, but Zabaza and Sense isn't done yet. He runs through hand signs, and a water dragon jutsu almost snipes Ao out of the air. As soon as he lands though, Zabaza is right back on him and going for deadly swipes and slashes with the sword. It appeared that Zabaza truly did have a bomb with these students, as currently, he was enraged and blinded by it. Al dodges and jumps around, but he becomes a bit less confident in speed every second, as Zabaza is getting closer and closer. But, like Zabaza had done to Naruto, the more seasoned shinobi takes advantage of the single-minded determination that he's being shown right now, and uses the now wet grass to his advantage. He slips under Zabaza's leg, kicking out his knees to make him kneel. He then flips back to his feet and catches Zabaza in a rear dragon sleeper, where usually the big fear of the opponent would be suffocation or having the neck jerked violently and snapped. Zabaza's brute strength and Al's lack of it caused the hold to be less effective though, and Zabaza would soon pry him off. The good thing was, Al was not trying to defeat Zabaza now. In a pretty bad situation like this one, Al comes to a conclusion that is pretty important. Zabaza is his better. Going into this situation, that wasn't clear, but he is fully aware that Zabaza has barely used his weapon or even fought with his usual one-hit kill maneuvers. At first, it seemed he'd been holding back to keep his identity secret, or possibly because full effort was too much for a little reward, or he could have wanted to take prisoners, or maybe he was bluffing and really was on his last legs. It didn't matter to Al. As a senior shinobi on the mission, he deemed combat a useless venture now. He just needs to hold Zabaza still enough to get him to calm down and inform him of that, and he does so very quickly. He also tells Zabaza that he had a secondary option to this mission given to him by the Mizukage and he alone, before Zabaza finally escapes the hold and doesn't attack him. 
Hal takes that as a sign of, you can live long enough to keep talking, and so explains the compartmentalization involved in this mission for him. Transparency was now the only way to complete the mission and make sure his team survives, and so, Hal reveals that Yagata is dead, even going far enough to reveal that the village is currently in hysteria because of the imminent reappearance of the Three Tails. And on top of that, rumors of Zabuza being alive have now grown to urban legends. Some people think that Zabuza finished what he started with the Mizukage, and that he's just waiting to come in and conquer the village for himself. So the current Mizukage not only wants to return the Executioner's Blade to the village, but is also campaigning to restart the Seven Ninja Swordsman as well. But the issue of Kisame Hoshigaki has made this a hesitant goal as well. But still, bringing Kubukiri Bocho back to the mist without Zabuza's head also satisfies mission parameters. So, the Mizukage has authorized him to bargain with Zabuza for the sword. Zabuza stays quiet for a moment, mulling over all that information. There's a lot to go over, and he does need to know at least one thing, and he can think of only one question to really answer it. Raising the crick of his sword to Al's throat, he demands to know if he really did mean to kill his students. With his speed, he could have easily taken at least one of them out to let him know that he was serious about this. Al was a bit taken aback by the simple question, but reveals that he wasn't given any orders about Guinea. Al scoffs at the simple question, but reveals that he's been spying on Zabuza for a while now, even while he was in the village gates. Using the Byakugan, he's investigated rumors of Zabuza being alive and in the Land of Fire, so he'd seen his Guinea team before, and he'd even reported this to the Mizukage but she was very adamant about them not being harmed permanently or killed, not only politically, but also ethically. His wisdom, though, quickly gives him the understanding of why Zabuza wants to know this, and being much more direct to get out of this situation with no more violence, he straightforwardly says that the village of the Bloody Mist is dead and gone. They're washing away that past and building a country that can proudly face the world. Still silent for a while, Zabuza finally grunts out that that's enough and reseals the Executioner's Blade. The former Mist Ninja tells the current one that he ain't selling the sword either, though. Walking over to his students, he is happy to see them all breathing easily, and Al can't help but feel his impression of Zabuza improve as he sees him pick up his students haphazardly, scooping them up onto his shoulders and putting Konohamaru under his arm. Al then noticed that Zabuza had released the water prison jutsu holding Gozu and Mizu after they'd finally fallen unconscious, and sets about cleaning and wrapping Mizu's wounds so he didn't bleed out. Finally, he stood up as well now, dragging both Demon Brothers by their collars as he and Zabuza face each other one last time. He admits that they'll likely send a messenger hawk next time, stressing that the new Mizukage wasn't letting it end this way and that she'd not give up on the sword. Zabuzu, sick of the pronoun game, asks who this new Kage is and is told, My Terumi, a name I believe Zabuza could recognize. Before he leaves, Ao asks one last question, why not sell the sword? And Zabuza answers that he's already promised someone. Don't let people in the village go around relating him to Kisame, even if they do think he's dead, they ain't nothing alike. And with that and a swirl of mist as his body flickers away, Ao chuckles and does the same. From there, the former assassin of the Hidden Mist Village was left to make the journey back to the Leaf Village. The unconsciousness of his students allows him time to think, and he can't get his mind off the idea of Kisame haunting more than just him. Not only that, today revealed there was still much to improve on for not only his students, but him as well. Team Zabuza returned to the village, and Zabuza himself decides to leave the information he'd learned about the change of power in the Hidden Mist to himself for now. He doesn't want to lead the Leaf into a trap of some kind. If Al turns out to be an especially good liar, that could really be bad for him. Though, in truth, he really didn't expect that to be the case. It wouldn't be so long before Team Kakashi also returns from their mission, resulting in Zabuza getting a good laugh at seeing Kakashi so wiped out, and someone angry that he really had missed out on a chance to take on Kisame again. Nevertheless, Naruto and Sakura gear up to follow the lead they had received from the Akatsuki member Sasori, a lead on where to find Sasuke. But unlike this arc, it will involve some big changes, and we'll leave things off here for right now. Hey guys, thanks for watching and doing so till the end. It really does mean a lot and do a lot during the current algorithm. There isn't a ton to say at the end of this video. Just please be sure to drop a like and a comment. Again, they do a lot. And if you do so, you're a real one. Um, Follow me on my social media, including Discord for sneak peeks and a great way to interact with the community if you really want to. Those are all linked in the description below. The only shout outs we owe this time go to our ever amazing patrons and you see them listed on the screen below. Hopefully there have been no additions or edits before the video uploads, but if they have been, I'll try and put some type of notification down there. In Hero Tier, Lone Wolf Quaid, Stefan Konsfrent, Treb, and Jonathan Howard. In Shinobi Tier, Little Ichigo. And in Beyond Tier, Crimson Manifesto, Pizza15X, Knuckles OX, Don, and DJ the Lazy Gamer. You guys were paramount in keeping the lights on for the last few weeks, and also a lot of the commissions that will be coming out in future what ifs, so thank you so, so much. Um, that'll do it for me, you guys, so as always, be sure to take care of yourselves, and as always, go beyond plus ultra. See you guys next time, and I love you.
Whoa, 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 pause. I actually owe a huge shout out to a buddy of mine. Ace the Wind Rider, AKA Ranger Ride from the Ranger Base. He's voice acted on the channel before, and this time he did the editing for this entire video. So go ahead and introduce yourself to the Plus Ultra fan, my dude. Thanks, man. Hey guys, I'm Ace. I'm a voice actor, editor, director, writer, artist, and a lot of other things as well. If you guys like what you saw today, please consider hitting me up on Twitter if you need some videos edited, or maybe you need a voice actor, or a lot of other stuff, or maybe you just want to chat. On top of that, if you really like what you saw today and you want to know more of what I do, definitely go check out my new channel, The Ranger Base. It's basically a channel where I get to talk about Pokemon, and the real world inspirations, and how they relate to the real world, and how you can experience the real world, and really appreciate what we have. It's a lot of fun, and I put my heart and soul into it, and I'm trying to grow my subscriber base so that way I can justify making more videos and bring more content. But either way, I had a lot of fun, I hope you guys enjoyed, and remember, go beyond Lust Ultra! Ultra!